Teresa Amavale noted well in her work that motivation needs to come intrinsically and that motivators that are extrinsic prevent creativity from being used by individuals. Although I have written about her theory a few times through this class, I really connect to her theory and can understand it as a way to explain how creativity and genius come together. With that theory, let's take a look at how Walt Disney was able to build an empire and create a legacy through his creativity. First I'll explain the four stages of the creativity process. It starts with a problem that ultimately needs a solution. That is where preparation for solving the problem comes in, which for Walt Disney might have been a need to create, even though MJ Winkler and her husband, Charles Mintz, had stolen the rights to one of his characters away from him, along with all but one of his animators. The next step is where the real fun begins for the creator and new ideas and responses to those ideas come in and the character that you recognize as Mickey Mouse was born. Although Disney's first two cartoons with Mickey failed, the final one, Steamboat Willie, proved a success as the last step of Amabile's creativity process, validating and working through ideas, started a legacy. Let's take a look at how Walt Disney went from Mickey Mouse to a massive empire. Looking at Disney's childhood, there was nothing spectacular about it, so there's not much to go off of there, except to say that he had always loved to draw, which might have played into later motivation. Disney had many reasons to give up throughout the years, and plenty of those extrinsic motivators that Amabile talks about, one of the biggest being reward or money for creating. I had the heavy... I had the prince and the girl, the romance. I had the sympathetic dwarfs and things. I wanted to, no doubt about the personality, so I sort of picked a name to fit the personality. So when I had bashful, he was bashful. I had happy, he was happy. I had dopey, he was dopey. I got voices for everybody. Look, the floor, it's been swept but we couldn't find the voice for doping. So we said, well, let's let him be mute, you see. We just won't give him a voice. That'll make him different. And it worked. We started Snow White sometime late 35, and we were we had it running in the theaters December 37. So actually, it was around two years of the making. According to Michael Barrier's book on Walt Disney, the studio's income went skidding down after Snow White from $4.35 million in the first nine months of 1938 to $3.84 million in the next 12 months to $272,000 in the last three months of 1939. You might think that this would be a good reason to give up on creating and start something different before the problem gets worse, but it is clear with the company's massive successes that this is not what happened. According to the Washington Post, Walt Disney thought and lived like an artist. What mattered was creating something beautiful and perfect. And like all real artists, he always ended up convinced that he'd failed to capture fully the fire that was in his brain. Amabile's theory can help explain what allowed Disney to continue because what was important to him was not the money. You know, I was stumped one day when a little boy asked, Do you draw Mickey Mouse? And I had to admit, I do not draw anymore. Well, then you think of all the jokes and ideas. No, I said, I don't do that. Finally, he looked at me and said, Mr. Disney, just what do you do? Well, I said, sometimes I think of myself as a little bee. I go from one area of the studio to another and gather pollen and sort of stimulate everybody. I guess that's the job I do. He ignored that creativity disruptor, along with others' opinions and competition, and allowed his passion to prevail. In the end, creativity won for Disney, and from Snow White to Elsa, the company is alive and well with more artists inspired to defeat extrinsic motivation and keep creating as they prove Amabile's theory to be true time and time again.